Philosophical History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction to The Philosophy of History by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. 3. Philosophical History No explanation was needed of the two previous classes. Their nature was self-evident. It is otherwise with this last, which certainly seems to require an exposition or a justification. The most general definition that can be given is that the philosophy of history means nothing but the thoughtful consideration of it. Thought is indeed essential to humanity. It is this that distinguishes us from the brutes. In sensations, cognition, and intellection, in our instincts and volitions, as far as they are truly human, thought is an invariable element. To insist upon thought in this connection with history may, however, appear unsatisfactory. In this science it would seem as if thought must be subordinate to what is given to the realities of fact, that this is its basis and guide. While philosophy dwells in the region of self-produced ideas without reference to actuality. Approaching history thus prepossessed, speculation might be expected to treat it as a mere passive material, and so far from leaving it in its native truth, to force it into conformity with a tyrannous idea, and to construe it, as the phrase is, a priori. But as it is the business of history simply to adopt into its records what is and has been, actual occurrences and transactions, and since it remains true to its character in proportion as it strictly adheres to its data, we seem to have in philosophy a process diametrically opposed to that of the historiographer. This contradiction, and the charge consequent brought against speculation, shall be explained and confuted. We do not, however, propose to correct the innumerable special misrepresentations, trite or novel, that are current, respecting the aims, the interests, and the modes of treating history, and its relation to philosophy. The only thought which philosophy brings with it to the contemplation of history is the simple conception of reason, that reason is the sovereign of the world, that the history of the world therefore presents us with a rational process. This conviction and intuition is a hypothesis in the domain of history as such. In that of philosophy, it is no hypothesis. It is there proved by speculative cognition that reason, and this term may here suffice us, without investigating the relation sustained by the universe to the divine being, is substance, as well as infinite power. Its own infinite material underlying all the natural and spiritual life which it originates, as also the infinite form, that which sets this material in motion. On the one hand, reason is the substance of the universe, namely, that by which and in which all reality has its being and subsistence. On the other hand, it is the infinite energy of the universe, since reason is not so powerless as to be incapable of producing anything but a mere ideal, a mere intention, having its place outside reality nobody knows where, something separate and abstract in the heads of certain human beings. It is the infinite complex of things, their entire essence and truth. It is its own material which it commits to its own active energy to work up, not needing, as finite action does, the conditions of an external material of given means from which it may obtain its support and the objects of its activity. 
it supplies its own nourishment, and is the object of its own operations, while it is exclusively its own basis of existence, and absolute final aim, it is also the energizing power realizing this aim, developing it not only in the phenomena of the natural, but also of the spiritual universe, the history of the world. That this idea or reason is the true, the eternal, the absolutely powerful essence, that it reveals itself in the world, and that in that world nothing else is revealed but this and its honor and glory, is the thesis which, as we have said, has been proved in philosophy and is here regarded as demonstrated. In those of my hearers who are not acquainted with philosophy, I may fairly presume at least the existence of a belief in reason, a desire, a thirst for acquaintance with it, in entering upon this course of lectures. It is, in fact, the wish for rational insight, not the ambition to amass a mere heap of acquirements, that should be presupposed in every case as possessing the mind of the learner in the study of science. If the clear idea of reason is not already developed in our minds in beginning the study of universal history, we should at least have the firm, unconquerable faith that reason does exist there, and that the world of intelligence and conscious volition is not abandoned to chance, but must show itself in the light of the self-cognizant idea. Yet I am not obliged to make any such preliminary demand upon your faith. What I have said thus provisionally, and what I shall have further to say, is, even in reference to our branch of science, not to be regarded as hypothetical, but as a summary view of the whole, the result of the investigation we are about to pursue, a result which happens to be known to me, because I have traversed the entire field. It is only an inference from the history of the world that its development has been a rational process, that the history in question has constituted the rational necessary course of the world spirit, that spirit whose nature is always one and the same, but which unfolds this, its one nature, in the phenomena of the world's existence. This must, as before stated, present itself as the ultimate result of history, but we have to take the latter as it is. We must proceed historically, empirically. Among other precautions, we must take care not to be misled by professed historians who, especially among the Germans and enjoying a considerable authority, are chargeable with the very procedure of which they accuse the philosopher introducing a priori inventions of their own into the records of the past. It is, for example, a widely current fiction that there was an original primeval people taught immediately by God, endowed with perfect insight and wisdom, possessing a thorough knowledge of all natural laws and spiritual truth, that there have been such or such sacerdotal peoples or, to mention a more specific averment, that there was a Roman epos, from which the Roman historians derive the early annals of their city, etc. Authorities of this kind we leave to those talented historians by profession, among whom, in Germany at least, their use is not uncommon. We might then announce it as the first condition to be observed that we should faithfully adopt all that is historical, but in such general expressions themselves as faithfully and adopt lies the ambiguity. Even the ordinary, the impartial historiographer, who believes and professes that he maintains a simply receptive attitude, surrounding himself only to the data supplied him, is by no means passive as regards the exercise of his thinking powers. He brings his categories with him, 
and sees the phenomena presented to his mental vision exclusively through these media. And, especially in all that pretends to the name of science, it is indispensable that reason should not sleep, that reflection should be in full play. To him who looks upon the world rationally, the world in its turn presents a rational aspect. The relation is mutual. But the various exercises of reflection, the different points of view, the modes of deciding the simple question of the relative importance of events, the first category that occupies the attention of the historian, do not belong to this place. End. Philosophical History. This recording is in the public domain.